Hello, my name is Melissa Lane. I am the Health and Temperance Leader at the Saginaw Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church in, um, in Saginaw, Michigan. My name is Bobby Porter. Good morning. It's good to see you. I am the Health and Temperance Leader for the Flint Fairhaven SDA Church. Thank you for joining us today as we complete our mental health series. Our topic today is addiction. I can't believe this is going to be the last topic in our series. It's gone by fast. It really has. It really has. But we've been covering a lot of great content. And today is going to be the same as we uh, complete the series on addiction. We're going to be playing uh, three videos today. Uh, the first one is by Dr. Jeff Baker. Just gives a little background as far as what addiction is and uh, how some people uh, cope with that. Uh, the second video, uh, we will have a discussion as far as uh, codependency, how that relates to addiction. And lastly, we will have a video with testimonials. Sounds like a lot of information. It is a lot of information. Uh, we'll have a short discussion in between because we want you to make sure you get the content uh, because it's, it's prevalent to, to this issue. So let's go ahead and An addiction is when someone uses a substance to either feel better or to make pain go away, physical pain or emotional pain. And when they're doing that, they will over time need more and more of it to get the same effect, to either to, again, make themselves feel better or make bad feelings go away. And if they stop using it, they'll start feeling really sick or, or for start feeling really uncomfortable. And therefore, they'll need the drug to get feeling good again. <laughs> Addictions happen because our brain has, uh, and this is the limbic system, our feeling orientation of our brain. It has three reward centers that, that stimulates the limbic system. And one is eating. Anytime we eat something that we love, it stimulates dopamine. And dopamine is this feeling good and says, remember this. So uh, food and baby making and escaping death are all things that ring the bell of our reward system. And we've learned over time, our very smart brain, to actually do those things recreationally. So now we can go to Disney World and ride the rides and and we escape death and our dopamine is stimulated and it says wow remember that that was great or we eat pizza and our brain says that's fantastic make sure to do that again and and also sexual behavior that that stimulates that reward system and our dopamine it makes us remember that and say how wonderful that was these are addictions that don't change your brain or won't end up killing you like alcoholism or heroin or cocaine but these are addictive behaviors and they're behaviors because we end up doing them to the point that, that they impair us or create dysfunction in our lives. The problem with drugs, it stimulates the reward system, but it also contaminates it because it overstimulates it and therefore changing the system. Our brain is made for, for sex and our brain is made for food. So if we are compulsively eating to escape negative feelings, we're still doing something that is a natural stimulant to the reward system. The first step that happens when your limbic system is being changed by the contamination of over drinking or using drugs is that the brain tries to correct that overstimulation by turning down the reward system. And because of that, then the individual feels, well, I have to use more of the drug for it to work for me again. And we start to develop a tolerance where the, the fight begins. I'm using more and more of the drug to get that same effect that helps me escape my emotional pain while the brain is turning down the limbic system to try to augment uh, this overstimulation because the, the bottom line, the brain wants to feel pain. And the same pathway for physical pain is emotional pain because pain is our way of a body protecting itself. 
So when you feel pain, you're able to take care of yourself. If you got a stomach ache, if you sprain your ankle, you, your body wants you to feel pain so you can take care of that. But if I'm overriding my pain by overstimulating it with the drug, I end up in this tug of war where I'm turning it up and overstimulating the reward system and the brain is trying to turn it down so I can still feel pain. So to feel good again, I have to use drugs. And and pretty soon, it won't even work to get me high. It won't help me feel good. I'll just feel normal when I'm using an enormous amount of drugs or alcohol. Yes, a functioning alcoholic and a functioning drug user is typically, uh, when you look at national trends, two things happen. You end up very, very skilled uh, people who are intelligent in jobs and in functions where the rest of their life is in shambles, but they keep their job. And they'll typically take a job way below their potential. Because again, their, their high level cognitive functions really aren't there. They deteriorate over time, but they still have a good skill base. So they'll do a job below their potential. And maybe they've had that job and achieved that position uh, before they got really strung out or really addicted. And they've moved to that place where they really need those cognitive skills, but they might be able to maintain that job even though their cognitive skills have declined but you'll see the rest of their life is in shambles. Everything else suffers. They'll try to maintain that job the best they can. But again, they, they will be functioning way below their ability. So one of the things that will happen if you yourself is suffering from addiction is to kind of notice what's changing in you and the people around you. Just here's a good, for instance, in drinking, the average male typically doesn't drink over four drinks, typically doesn't do 14 in a week. If you're exceeding that and your crowd is changing, with your drinking, in other words, you're changing your social circles to be with people who are also progressing in drinking, or you notice that the people that used to hang around with you don't because you drink very differently, that's a big deal. The end result of the person's addiction is they are using and they are so out of control, they can't stop. Their life is unmanageable. And even though life, the drugs are causing these terrible problems, they can't stop because their cravings are not just psychological. They're completely physiological and neurobiological. And because of that, they are driven to continue, even though they keep getting bad feedback from all their behaviors. These terrible consequences don't stop them. So to, to the addict's mind, they see all these terrible consequences of their using of why they're using. And the fact is, it's just the opposite. The terrible consequences are because they're using, but they, they, they have a hard time seeing that. Their, their, their judgment, their reasoning, all their executive functions that would allow you to make good decisions is completely contaminated. So when you think about how do I get help or how do I help somebody else? They're two very different questions in terms of if you're at the point that you recognize you need help, I would start by either one of two things. I would attend some type of peer support group at a church or in your local neighborhood, or I would go to your primary care physician. Now, when you notice a loved one is struggling with an addiction, this is a very difficult situation because they maintain this even though they're driven, but they have enormous amounts of shame enormous amounts of shame. So addressing this directly can be very difficult. So some of the things I encourage people to do is movies. Watch a movie together. The movies that I like are Leaving Las Vegas, Clean and Sober, and Train Spotting. I think those provide excellent discussions that it's very difficult to have in a straightforward way. These are all R-rated movies. Uh, they're really dark, but this subject is very difficult to talk about. Uh, and you, oh, and the other thing you can do is just YouTube. There are even some interesting, just little comedy cartoons on there about addiction that you could show children. Uh, so I would do my homework. 
uh, on YouTube and and look on the internet for movies that uh, that address this issue. And uh, I, I think there's lots and lots of information out there that can begin a conversation you need to have. If it's a coworker and uh, certainly uh, somebody that you're supervising at work, you're going to find those behaviors at work that are going to be uh, the stimulus to talk about, like what's going on. And uh, let me let me just share a list with you of the kinds of things that you can see. Number one would be concentration, absenteeism. Uh, uh, not being there with no really a good excuse or the same excuse over and over. And I'm sure there's somebody who did have the dog eat their homework, but it's just a lousy excuse and you can't have it over and over. Uh, even uh, their energy level, their stamina. So at the end of the day, you see a significant decline that wasn't there before. And all addictions are progressive. So this is, go this is not going to get better. It will get worse and worse. If you think there's something in your life that's beginning to control you, you have lost control. You are no longer in charge. Find a way to have the conversation you're not having with someone, if it's you, or with them. No one feels good having a conversation like that. But it will begin to change your life. It will absolutely be progressive. It never levels off, and it will take their life. I really enjoyed Dr. Baker's um, description as far as uh, what addiction is, um, how um, people try to cope with depression. Um, and it's just really telling that addiction, most people think about, relates to substance abuse or alcohol. But really addiction can be taken into in a different context as well as, as far as pornography, gambling, um, also mentioned as far as the addiction to being busy all yes, the time. Yes. You really don't have things to do, but you choose to do certain things to keep yourself going. So. And um, we don't often talk about the addiction that, um, the fact that addiction starts usually very young. Um, children might inadvertently um, come across something they shouldn't in even their grandparents' home. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we don't really talk about a lot is the fact that you can be addicted and still be, quotes, a professional. Yes. Sometimes we think about a person who's addicted as a person who's um, perhaps in a low socioeconomic uh, group, somebody who is on the streets, and that's not necessarily so. The other thing we don't talk about either a lot is the effect that the different addictions, particularly the substance abuse, mm -hmm. has on the body. But the other addictions, like you mentioned pornography, mm -hmm. Um, the, the addiction to business, anything that's n not balanced, you're not temperate, yes. has an effect on the body as well as the mind. So addictions are, can be very, very harmful. Absolutely. And I also think about work, technology. Mm -hmm. You know, how many times are people just are constantly on your phones? You know, sometimes I've, um, have you ever gone out to, um, prior to COVID, to the mall or um, just you're just out and about and you see a group of kids together and instead of them talking to one another they're in their phones they're texting the phones, yeah. texting, and they may be sitting next to the person but they're yeah. texting <laughs> exactly Either that or they're looking at their iPads or whatever mm -hmm. yeah, instead of talking in fact that really has become a problem because kids don't seem to know how to talk and not just kids people mm -hmm. we don't talk as well face to face to each other um, which is going to be a, a real issue. Absolutely. Absolutely. So next we're going to um, show a video regarding codependency, mm -hmm. how that goes hand in hand yes. with addiction. Um, and code, codependency, is it a factor of helping the person or are you harming the person? So let's go ahead. So codependency, relationships are great, but you know, what happens when it's the thing rather than a thing? What happens when a relationship 
uh, that you're willing to stay in it and sacrifice your own dignity or even physical safety when it's abusive, exploitive, parasitic, or it completely neglects you, but yet you stay in it. That's that's what codependency is, uh, and 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 it's it's an a like an obsessive compulsion that people uh, hold on to. That's not a clinical or mental disorder. We don't have a clinical definition for it, so I'm kind of just throwing my view of it out there where people uh, will hold on to these relationships, even though obviously they are very, very dysfunctional and and they are pouring themselves, all their resources into this relationship without any reciprocation or even uh, taking advantage of uh exploited or even hurt or sometimes even killed. So I believe that there are underpinnings that drive this. Underpinnings like depression or childhood trauma, any issue that would erode your self-esteem or your self-concept, make you very vulnerable for these people to attach to you and for you to need them so very much. Where this relationship somehow resolves your feelings of deprivation anxiety. It's a fear-driven behavior, no doubt about it. But I believe that is caused by some underpinning of probably a mental disorder that is cloaked by what we call codependency. The the codependent issue uh, was born out of this idea when we looked at alcoholism and those who had relationships with these very dysfunctional people and were doing what we used to call back then enabling their behavior. In other words, maintaining the relationship and actually helping this alcoholic get work. Think of the, the, the entire bigger picture is that my identity is tied up in this relationship. So if, if I feel that I'm being a good husband, And the only way I know that I'm a good husband is if you're happy with me, that I, my whole idea is to keep you happy. But if my spouse is drinking and drinking and drinking, I'm going to do whatever I need to, to make sure they're happy. And although I know it's wrong and I know they're drinking too much and I know I'm bailing them out of jail and all that kind of stuff, to not do those things, I would feel terrible, crushing guilt. So my behavior is is actually very selfish in that I'm doing this to avoid the crushing feelings of guilt of being a bad husband by not helping you with the consequences of your drinking then we really have to manage the guilt that what what are you willing to do to save somebody you care about even though you might feel some guilt what are you willing to do even though it might be just excruciating to do the right thing in order to save this person or are you willing to continue to do the things that's killing this person by helping them maintain their drug abuse or alcoholism in order for you to not feel guilt so you can feel comfortable. Now, when we look at that, it's it's really changed and become more definitive and that some of these characteristics can be not necessarily as much personality, but probably, again, childhood PTSD. It could be depression It's or things that have happened that have eroded this person's self-esteem and made them vulnerable. When those underpinnings are addressed and their self-concept changes, they can evolve and recover from this dynamic. All relationships have conflicts. I mean, that's what makes them normal. However, when you listen to a friend and their conflicts start to look abnormal and more frequent than what you would expect, and this is kind of a big indicator. When you have that moment when your friend is telling you about a conflict and you go, what? You know, when you have that moment and then you say to them, what did they do? And and then they defend them. When you see this defensiveness to protect this relationship that is obviously starting to teeter off to that 
that extreme dysfunction, that's what gets our attention because why can't my friend have this very straightforward discussion about why they would tolerate that? Where are the respectful parameters in this relationship that would maintain its health? Those parameters have been breached and now we're moving towards even things like domestic violence, which, which is awful. And, and can be very, very dangerous and deadly. But yet they maintain these relationships. And sometimes even their support group will tell them they have to because they, they say that you, you can't leave them because you're married or whatever. And that they, that religious institution says you have to stay in there because he hasn't cheated on you, even though he may have beaten you or beaten children, but you have to stay there. And so a lot of times there are supportive networks like parents who say that you have to stay there because they don't want the embarrassment of you leaving that relationship. And so these networks can maintain that as well as their own thinking when the relationship can be quite abusive, even dangerous or exploitive or parasitic. Typically people who have got that far in domestic violence don't leave on their own uh, until a, a breaking point that maybe they care enough about their children that their child, they see their children being hurt by this, by this person. They're willing to do that. Or oddly enough, uh, a lot of people are willing to stay in domestic violence with the physical abuse, but the emotional abuse starts to be too much. Probably the biggest issue is support is that somebody is supporting them that this is just wrong. And, and again, they have, they have a feeling in their gut they know it's wrong, but they, they hold on to some fantasy hope in their minds. And at some point, reality of what's happening and their fantasy of what this person could be just becomes too, they're too far apart to, to be able to sustain that fantasy. Well, there are shelters. Uh, when we're talking about domestic violence, there are women's shelters uh, and 800 numbers that people can call and start that process. Uh, typically, though, the more common thing is a friend. A friend is willing to allow you to come in and stay with them until you get yourself organized to get your own place and so on. But Or, or parents. Uh, but the most most common thing is friendships and your support network. But when things get uh, to the point they're dangerous and people are afraid, there are shelters all across the country. So if I had a friend who's struggling with codependency and they're in a very abusive relationship, I like to start people by watching a movie with me. So Jennifer Lopez and Enough. Uh, Enough is a great movie where you can watch it together and then hopefully stimulate the conversation you need to. Julia Roberts made a movie, Sleeping with the Enemy. Again, this is a movie that can stimulate the kind of discussions that you need to. If you're that person, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is at what point are you going to allow all your resources of time and energy be depleted? to the point that it impairs you. And if this is your friend at work, you'll see that because they'll be depleted. Their time, their energy, their money is all going to go to this person. And you'll notice that they'll be fatigued. They'll, they may be, uh, their dress apparel, uh, is, is not going to be the same as it used to because their resources are being depleted, siphoned away by someone else. If it's domestic violence, then some of the things you'll see bruises, makeup covering up bruises, or people just secluding themselves and you'll never be invited over to their place because that's a place that uh, people want to keep secret. If this is happening and you begin to notice that it was a work, the number one thing you have to do is to have that conversation, the conversation you haven't had yet. Okay, codependency, was, that was really very, very interesting. Um, sometimes I think people try to help mm -hmm. their friend or their family member 
who has, has an addiction problem, and they think they really are helping, but instead, they're not helping, they're enabling. Right, and um, it's a fine line yes. uh, between the two. And you don't want an individual suffering. We, don't, we never want someone to go without. Yes. And I think it's in our innate nature to lend a helping hand when we can. Yes. But we can take that to the extreme, like you stated, and it becomes more harmful for that individual. So, for instance, if someone um, is addicted to smoking, if you're going out and buying that person a, a pack of cigarettes, you're not really helping them overcome that addiction. And maybe you won't be harping on the, the uh, bad effects of smoking, but you let them know that you really are not interested and don't want to participate in secondhand smoking. Mm -hmm. And that even secondhand smoking is not healthy for you. And that um, as a nurse, I would tell them some of the things that I've seen, the patients that I've seen who are missing parts of their body. Yes. It's really kind of gruesome from cigarette smoking or cigar smoking or dipping snuff. Mm -hmm. None of that is, is healthy. And so to just, again, not harp on it, but to let them know that you're aware that um, it's not healthy. And let's not pretend that it's healthy. Exactly. So uh, even though you have good intentions, it's okay to say no and also seek help for that individual. Um, there are a lot of groups out there, a lot of um, associations who can help individuals with alcoholism, with pornography, um, and even with uh, substances. Yes. There's even groups out, uh, available for uh, family members and friends to go to so mm -hmm. that they will learn about codependency and make sure they're not making a problem even worse or enabling that person. Absolutely. So we're going to go ahead and show our last video. And um, this last video has testimonials of individuals who suffered from addiction and also how they have overcome. Well, we were in college and he spotted me, apparently. And freaked out. And like when I saw her, I was like, I immediately knew that was my wife. But she was the first girl I couldn't talk to. That was back when AOL was the thing. And he asked me in the dorm for my screen name. And it was just persistence, or maybe she felt sorry for me in the beginning. Each time I would spend time with them, at first I was like, he's not cute. And then the next time I was like, well, he's kind of cute. Yeah, he's kind of sweet. And then, like, he's hot. I love this guy said anything and everything the wrong way, and she still, for some reason, fell for me. <laughs> Dad, Dad? Mama. Happy birthday. I love you, Mama. I love you. Look at him say, love you. In 2013, I found myself sitting in office as a missions pastor and truly navigating something by faith. But I literally had no clue what I was doing. But I, I was eager. I was excited. It was a big transition. I knew at some point I would be involved in ministry. I just didn't know it'd be as a pastor's wife. But I welcomed it because it was kind of a life that I had always seen myself at some point living in, in some capacity. We were going to do an outreach that brought the community in. And at the same time, I had a root canal that was needed to be done. And I went to the dentist and got a prescription for painkillers. A couple weeks went by and another stressful situation happened. Schedule an appointment with my doctor. And I just shared I couldn't organize my thoughts. I couldn't get the task done like I needed to. And I remembered that I used to take Adderall uh, when I was just out of college to help me study and to prepare. And, and that was like a miracle drug for me. I took one and then I wanted more and took more and more and more until three days later, I'd used all of my medication. Addiction is a way of coping with life when you don't know how to do so relationally. 
So if you learn at a young age that when I have stress, when I have worry, when I'm sad, when I am fearful, if I use a substance or I use a process to return to joy or to return to hope, it, it will never have the same effect as a relationship. So it's a way of coping with life, but it's a maladaptive way of coping with life. It will never work. I can remember as a 10 year old taking my first pain pill and liking the feeling that I had. And it made me feel instead of down and like almost um, lethargic and disconnected, it, it actually gave me energy and it made me feel confident in what I was pursuing at the time. I always saw it as something I could stop. Like I could just use Adderall to get this job done, then I'm good. If I could just use the painkillers to, to get me off of Adderall, then I'm, I'm okay. But I never actually took that first step to try to stop. I just kept putting it off and putting it off. Addiction actually creates a cycle in the brain and there are certain neural pathways that are being stimulated and creating large neural networks that then progress over the span of a lifetime and that's why addiction gets worse with time. I was exposed to pornography when I was probably about 12 from a neighbor friend of mine. And as soon as I saw it, it wasn't like there was a revulsion or anything. It was, I was completely immediately addicted to it. Back then there wasn't internet. So pornography was all magazines and and books and things like that. So I remember at like 13, going into uh, Walden Books, a bookstore, and having this urge to, to look at the magazines because I knew they were there. And so I would get like a teen magazine and grab one of the pornography magazines and put it like in inside of it. And just doing something and knowing it was so wrong, but feeling like I, I had no control. And that's, that's really when it all started for me. On average, the kids first are exposed to pornography is eight. And so it's almost like certain, you know, it's like if they have a friend who has a phone, there's a really good chance that somebody's shared that with them. And so when something else comes across my path, those kinds of things are stimulating the brain and, and the brain goes, oh, well, that felt good. I haven't felt like that before. Um, I think I'll do that again. The brain wants to do what works, right? So addiction isn't necessarily our brain misfiring or, or working incorrectly. The brain is actually saying, oh, that worked, try that again. And it will keep on working. But what we know about addiction is it never satiates. So the process only causes more of a heightened progression. And that's why we have levels of addiction. When I was really little, I was very affectionate, very fun-loving, very goofy. And that really all changed when, around five years old, my grandfather sexually abused me. About nine or 10, I was at a, a neighbor's house. I was locked in a room with the girl and her sister and they very violently sexually abused me. And I don't remember even anything after it, but running home. Addiction is, is connected to like undealt with grief, right? You're gonna find almost in every story of addiction, regardless of age, uh, some kind of deficit emotionally uh, that people are trying to, to deal with. And so they, they cope with it. If there's abuse in the situation, not only now is there a void, there's also a lot of emotional pain and I need distraction from that pain. And this addiction provides me that distraction. It was summer of 2016 that we got the phone call. That her dad had just went unconscious at her house. So we loaded up and went to the hospital, and he had passed before we had gotten there. 
So it was very traumatic for our whole family. It was in that place where the first thought I had was I didn't want to deal with this pain. And so I called the doctor and asked if I could get a script. And so I got a script for Adderall. We attempted to get my father-in-law's affairs in order. And it's like I'm sitting here going through my father-in-law's stuff of the things that he left behind. Meanwhile, thinking, what would happen if I died right now? What would I have left my family? <laughs> I, I had a picture of my wife sitting, going through all this stuff at my death and how surprised she would be to know that the man that she, that she fell in love with was trapped. And so I stuffed it. Instead of letting that reality create a change in me, it caused me to want to perform even more. And so the drugs became even more. Addiction, all it needs is secrecy and shame to build. That's how it grows. And so when we go into an addiction cycle, there's a preoccupation involved, then there's a ritualization, then there's an acting out, then there's a despair. What happens in our culture is when someone is severely addicted to a substance or to sexuality, there is a stigma to it that they're worse than the rest of us. There's something more wrong with them, and we almost pity or we view them as monsters. Like if somebody comes in and they have a pornography addiction, identifying it as, well, this is wrong and bad first, I mean, all that's going to do in my mind is reinforce someone's shame. How do you kind of separate out? Is this like, is it a moral issue and is it an addiction? But it, it's both. Part of it is helping people say like, it's, look, it's not healthy. I don't know if I would even say it's, it's moral in the sense of like looking at it as right or wrong. It's like, it's not healthy. I feel alone, isolated, worthless. And then you see something that's gratifying and pleasurable. It's like, well, that's the opposite feeling that I have when I'm in this state. Right, and so you see that pattern continue. I really wasn't experiencing any freedom, and I was in a place where I didn't even know what to do. I didn't feel like I could control it, and the more I watched pornography, the deeper that I had to get into watching things that were worse and worse. And when I started doing it, it really began to scare me. And at that point, I didn't even feel like I cared. It was like literally beginning to numb myself to where I couldn't even feel anymore. I began to be more isolated, isolated from my husband emotionally. I began to even not want to be around my kids. I don't think that they knew that, but, but I knew it. And so I knew that this was a really big problem that had really gripped my life. I felt like even my, my brain needed it. They compare it to a, a pornography addiction to cocaine addiction. It triggers the same pleasure signals that it does for drugs. So physically, even my body felt like I had to have it or I couldn't calm down. So there are process addictions and there are substance addictions. Um, substance addictions are gonna be like your alcoholism, your drug addiction, where a process addiction is going to be more your uh, sex addiction, pornography, eating disorders, and such. These are things that you're not necessarily having to take in to change that biochemical state, but there is a dopamine release attached to it. And so being able to escape is why a lot of people do that. But what they're escaping from or what they're trying to, to run from or avoid, I think is, is undealt with grief or pain. The greatest factor to help people move out of addiction is community or being bonded with other people. It's like, well, I don't want to expose myself. Well, but the thing that you need most beyond just working through the understanding the emotional deficit and any trauma or grief is you need other people. Like, you're not gonna make it without other people. 
It was April 12th. I went to a funeral of a young 20-year-old that had overdosed. Right after the funeral, I went to someone's house, and it was an innocent visit at first, but left on the sink in the bathroom was a pill bottle full of hydrocodone. And then there was only like two or three pills in there, and I took one. The next day, I woke up. It was almost as if the Lord spoke to me audibly. He said, repentance is a gift. He's like, your journey, your journey starts today. My executive pastor at the time called an emergency meeting and said, you need to come in. And all kinds of emotions are going through panic. I had no proof that I was about to be caught, but I was praying that I would actually get caught. And I walked into the office and my executive pastor and my pastor were there and I just lost it. And, and they didn't have to say a word. They're like, we know what you've been doing. I was like, I want freedom. I want out. I need help. And so I confessed everything to them. Meanwhile, my wife has no clue. And I got a phone call from the senior pastor that said, um, Brian's fine, but you need to get to the office as soon as you can. And I walked into the office, and the senior pastor was sitting there. And he sat me down, and he said, I'm not going to make you wait any longer because Brian's tied up at the moment. But um, he is addicted to drugs. He called us both into the office with the senior, it was a senior pastor, the associate pastor, and Brian and I. And he couldn't look at me, and I couldn't look at him. And there was a heaviness in the room, and I just remember feeling so broken. I felt so blindsided. Um, being that I work in neonatal intensive care, I see withdrawal signs in babies, but I missed them all in my husband. And I thought to myself, like, how could I be so stupid to miss all these red flags? And as soon as I found out on the way home, all the dots started to connect that I could just see. And I'm like, how could I have missed it? And that was hard. If you don't know someone's struggling with something and all of a sudden that gets exposed, the first thing that I always hear is like, well, he doesn't love me, or there's something wrong with me because he does X. Do I matter? Do they love me? Am I pretty enough? There's a 99% chance that coping mechanism started way before you and this person ever even met each other or got married and started having kids. I remember just feeling like, like I was such a disappointment to a man who waited for me. At that point, I did have a female pastor in my life that I immediately confessed to. My husband didn't know. And even though I was being transparent and honest with this pastor, he happened to oversee a Facebook message where I was talking to her about it. And that was the first time that he knew my struggle. And he went through all of those questions and it was really hard for me. I had, you know, I was the one that did this to him. I didn't even know any women struggling with pornography. Before I found Pure Desire, every ministry I had contacted said, oh, we only help men. And so I felt even more ashamed. And well, I shouldn't struggle with this. So there's a difference between, sometimes we call it a healthy shame versus a toxic shame. The guilt or the, the healthy shame is, I did something bad. I know who I am, I'm a good person, and then I didn't act like myself. And I feel badly about that. But with a toxic shame, it says, I'm a bad person. There's something inherently wrong with who I am. I don't belong, people don't want me, and I don't even want myself. I'm wrestling this whole time with like, how can I be a Christian? How can I be a pastor? How can I do all these things, be all this, and, and struggle with addiction? And when I walked into rehab, I'm with 17 guys that are struggling with sex addiction, drug addiction, 
like literally anything that you could think of. They did introductions and I, and I listened as each guy told their like worst sin and their worst struggle. And I just wept and I wept because I was in a place where I felt like I could belong. Man, you're struggling with that. Well, here's what I'm struggling with. And it was like a true community where it was authentic. Nobody was hiding. Everything was out in front. And I felt like I could just be whoever I am. I never told anyone because when I grew up in the church, sex was never spoken of. Or if it was, it was don't do it until you get married. So for me, the shame was so great to even struggle with anything sexual that it literally kept me keeping it secret. I think the shame really started to break for me when I did expose it to another person who accepted me. Not only was the physical beginning to change, but my relationship with God was changing to where I knew that he was there for me in those places where I was being abused. In that moment when those girls were abusing me, I just saw Jesus standing there just crying. The shame really began to shift when I began to truly believe that I was worth Jesus fighting for. And I don't think I struggle with shame really at all anymore. We all fail, and if I fail, big deal. I used to, when I used to fail, I used to just beat myself up. And that would just cause me to go to it even more. That's what really happened for me. The shame began to fade away because when I was hurting, I would go to him instead of something else for comfort. As someone goes into recovery process, we want them to get into behaviors that are, are life-giving and set up more of those behaviors than the others, right? So that we have lots of options for exercise, eating right, getting out into nature, being in community, engaging in relationship. In fact, one developmental understanding is that when that is not done for a child, they actually are very susceptible toward addiction because they don't know what does give purpose, what is engaging. Well, I guess video games are, I guess drugs and alcohol, but it never satiates, right? It's only going to progress and it's only going to get worse unless there are some real, truly healthy and life-giving things that are creating that sense of purpose and connection. Is that true, 50%? Is that what they're saying? Well, what happens is we did a clinical study of a, when they put up a SAS test, sexual versus screen test, there were 58% of passers were sexual addicts, and 50% of women struggled with it as well. So Heidi's not in your So 50, 58% of passers sexual addicts. I don't know they are. I think Trey Hart is going to set the problem. They promised himself they'll never do it again, and they'll do it again, and they'll do it again. Because what's driving you is trauma in their life. And the result trauma is driving the addiction. I had never really shared with him deeply about how those events and things affected me. But as we began to go through that process and really work through our, our relationship, he really began to be a safe place. Not only was I in a pure desire group with other women, and going through this 10-month counseling process with my husband, that's when I really began to realize, hey, I'm, I'm not struggling with these things anymore. Not to say that I'm not tempted, because I still am, but those things just begin to fall away. Be not only intimate with my husband, but with friends. Just really having intimate relationships with people begin to really shift all of the addiction. Where I am now is I'm in a place where I have people in my life that I've allowed into my life to speak into me. If they see blind spots, 
if they see areas that are concerned, they can actually ask me questions. And even if I lie to them, they're going to know me enough to know if I'm lying, lying to you. And slow. Through Brian's recovery, he started and opened up his own gym called Cedar Point Fitness and brought the same healing process through rehab and that we had learned as a family into the aspect of his gym. When I have couples that come in and it's like, hey, you made a mistake, but your life matters, your family matters, you're responsible for them. So the spouse, it's the same thing. It's like, look, this is really hard. But if you'll come in and you'll do the work that you need to do and you'll fight for it, and it's worth fighting for. Like, you could tell the story that, hey, we went and we fought for it, right? Like, we came through this, and so what does that do? It gives hope to other people. It's like, what story do you want to tell 20 years from now versus what story are you telling now? When I think about where I am now, and it took a long time for me to get there, I think for the first time in my life ever, I feel free. Now became so afraid of making mistakes. Cause one heart full is all that it takes. <laughs> to make you question the man you thought you'd be. I begin to question the bright things you see in me. Love is patient. Love is kind. Walking out of rehab, it was just those changes of like what I've missed coupled with the healing that had happened, the freedom that I experienced. It was, it was difficult because I know that my family didn't experience that same thing. I took a plane ride home and I walked in the doors. My kids went nuts. I'll never forget it. Like the moment that I got tackled with my kids was, <laughs> it was incredible. It's not something that we've really talked a whole lot about, but we do realize that once they get to the age, it has to be something that we do talk about. And I think just being open and real to them of, of this is what we went through and this was hard, but through God's grace and you know we're on the other side of it. Thank you. But I'm here to tell you that real healing is possible. I've experienced true change. I've seen God heal my femininity and experience real intimacy with my husband. And I would never change that for the world. All the pain that I went through, I would never change for what deepness of relationship I have now with God and my husband. It's like when you have somebody tell you, your life matters, like no matter what, your life matters. Like we gotta find a way to work through this and I'm here to help you do that. I think that'll rise people up. The most hopeful thing is that joy connections propagate faster than addiction. And so if we're creating communities of love, communities where people of all various types of experiences, addictions, mental illnesses, etc., are accepted and they have belonging, we actually have more power than the drug dealers or the pornographers or whoever. We have more power to affect change because what we have to offer works a lot better. The things that we keep hidden cannot be healed unless they're brought to the light. And the truth is what sets you free. And it's what set me free. I really love those testimonial videos. I do too. Um, it, it really provides a realistic view of what people suffer um, through. And again, those people are making themselves vulnerable by sharing their story. Yes. And I'm glad that they're doing that. One of the things I really appreciated about the one video at the very beginning with the family is that although the, the person who was addicted had issues and 
obviously he was hurting inside, mm -hmm. but also it showed the family and what his addiction did to the family. And sometimes we forget about the, suffer the suffering family. Mm -hmm. And we think that they're not impacted, but the spouse is impacted, the children are, mm -hmm. even though it looks like they're not, and we don't know what long-term effects they even has on the children. So chances are, not only does the person who's addicted need to seek counseling, but probably um, it'd be beneficial for the whole family to seek counseling. Exactly. Um, and, well, we want to talk about as far as coping mechanisms. How do you cope with addiction? Um, and like we said it before, there are groups that you can join. Yes. Um, also, um, you can always see a therapist to help with addiction. Um, and in fact, I would say, see, seek the therapist. Mm -hmm. Seek the therapist. They're the one that's going to talk you through it. Mm -hmm. Who's going to help you see how to relate or react mm -hmm. or discuss with your family members. Mm -hmm. They're going to even talk to you about the group sessions that you sign up with and how is that going. And maybe that's not the right group session that you should be in. They may suggest a different kind of group session mm -hmm. depending on your particular problem. Absolutely. But the thing about it is seek help. Yes, always. Seek help because at the end of the day, the addiction is not the problem itself. Yes. It's we need to we need to get to the root cause of the problem. Yes. And whether you suffered from something in your childhood or an event has taken place recently, such as losing your job or um, someone became ill in the family yes. and you weren't really able to handle mm -hmm. that ordeal in your life. This is a journey. Yes, it is. This is not something that is going to be easily cured mm -hmm. or you're going to get over. Um, start a journal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Write down um, what you've done that day. Write something good mm -hmm. um, and show the victories that you experienced. Exactly. And as you read back mm -hmm. on that information, whenever you're feeling down or you get that urge where you need yes. to um, slide back into that behavior, you can always go back to that journal and, and say, you know what, that day I had a victory moment. Mm -hmm. Now the second video talked more about pornography. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting to me because we always associate pornography with men. Mm -hmm. Now we're not going in that direction to say why it's men. But the point is that women have issues with pornography also. Absolutely. And not just women, but if, you, if we really were to go back and look at the history of people who are, have issues of pornography, we'll find out that it's not just men and women, it's children. Mm -hmm. They start usually at a very, very young age. Mm -hmm. They accidentally got hold of a magazine or they went on maybe a friend. Mm -hmm. Shared something with them. Inappropriately, yeah. yes. either on their phone mm -hmm. or on their iPad or their, their, um, their what the, what the your tablet. Called? Thank you, your tablet. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just for a minute, my mind went blank. But the point is that it was there was some inappropriate action, and the thing that really gets me, and that occurred to me, is that when Satan hits you with that, it's almost like you're startled. You you're not thinking. You see it, and it's attractive. Mm -hmm. But what is it? Mm -hmm. And it's and it's almost. I thought about Eve mm -hmm. when she got to the tree, and and she was filled with curiosity. And instead of just turning right around and leaving, mm -hmm. she stayed there for a little bit. She dwelt on it, mm -hmm. and she was hooked. And it's the same thing with pornography. Mm -hmm. At first, um, when the person was um, describing it in other stories, they looked at it, and they were kind of tense and uh, startled, and they wanted to shy away and back away. Mm -hmm. But they didn't. They stayed. Or if they didn't stay, they went back to it again and again and again until pretty soon it wasn't so shocking anymore. Mm -hmm. But it was you become a, desensitized. You, you become desensitized, and you want more of it. Mm -hmm. You want more, just like being addicted to drugs. You know, you you want more. You you can't stop using it. Mm -hmm. And so we need to we need to talk about it as a church. It's not shaming. It happened. Let's deal with it. Absolutely. And encourage a person, yes, to get counseling. But as a church, make it an open. Uh, something we need to talk about, not a shameful thing. And if the person doesn't want to talk in a large group. Maybe find somebody that they are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, that's, a, that's a great idea. We need to bring um, these issues to the forefront, yes. not in the church as well as in the community, yes. because um, this is a stronghold that people cannot get over. Right. And um, as a church, we definitely need to have open arms and, and be loving yes. towards the situation and not condemning. Yes. 
lives. I'm There's no perfect person on this earth. Well, no, he left, didn't he? He went to heaven. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's in heaven right now. And, you know, we need to stop putting on this facade like we are perfect because we all fall short. We all have problems, and I'm glad you said we need to let those barriers down because we need to let that two-way communication flow so that way we can help one another. That's what we're here for. That's right. We're on this earth to help one another, to build one another up, and, and too much we find ourselves tearing each other down, and, and that's where we need to stop. And I, and I can't emphasize enough that if you don't have a support group and the people you go to or you begin to put out initial feelers, you know, they're not very receptive to, that's all right. Leave them folks alone because their problems will be made manifest before too long. You go to somebody else. Don't give mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. God has got the person that you will help and he's got the person that will be a blessing to you. And when you build that, um, when you build that support system up, and when I think about support system, I think about friends and family who love you, mm -hmm. who are willing to stop and listen, mm -hmm. and to you be vulnerable to them. Um, then when you've got the support group coming up, when, those, when you're tempted again to do those things that are harmful to you, whatever that addiction is, the family members will grab you and say, mm -mm, not today, yeah. not today. Mm -hmm. Let's pray about it. Yeah. And I... Also, we need to trust Jesus, pray, and know that he is the answer to every malady, every sinful problem that we have. He is the only, he's not just the answer, he is the only, you know, the answer, only answer. And the best answer. Yes, absolutely. So you can trust him. Wow, Elder Porter, this has been a powerful discussion. This yes. is really good. God is good. Yes, <laughs> and we will have more this evening. So please join us tonight at 7.30 p.m. as we continue our discussion on addiction. Yep. Please, if you need prayer or if you need additional information, please contact us at either one of the churches. You can go to Ephesus' website at esdac.org, or you can go to Fairhaven's website at fairhavensda.org. Now, you know, one thing we want to mention, number one, is make sure you come, but then tell somebody else about this. And there are others we don't, don't know who may be hurting. Tell them about this. And also, at the end of the program, there'll be the 1-800 number that you can call to get help. Absolutely. So I think that is it for us today. Thank you for joining us. And again, 7.30 tonight, we will continue our discussion regarding addiction. Have a good day.